All right, everyone. We're going to get started with our panel. I hope everyone's enjoying their dinner. So, Samuel Goldman is an associate professor of political science at George Washington University, where he's also executive direct director of the John L. Loeb Jr. Institute for Religious Freedom and director of the Politics and Values Program. His most recent book is After Nationalism, Being American in a Divided Age. Goldman received his PhD from Harvard and taught at Harvard and Princeton before coming to George Washington University. In addition to his academic work, Goldman is a literary editor of Modern Age and a contributing editor at the American Conservative. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications. Daniel McCarthy is vice president of the Collegiate Network and the editor-in-chief of ISI's quarterly journal, Modern Age, a conservative review. Previously, Dan was the director of the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program at the Fund for American Studies. His work has appeared in a wide variety of publications, including First Things, The Spectator, The New Criterion, The National Interest, The New York Times, and The American Conservative, where he served as editor from 2010 to 2016. He's currently a visiting fellow at the Catholic University of America's, of America's Center for the Study of Statesmanship, and has pre previously held fellowships at the Ludwig von Mises Institute and the Claremont Institute. He lives in Alexandria, Virginia, and is a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis, where he founded a collegiate network publication, The Washington Witness. Great. Well, thank you, Barbara. So our panel tonight is a discussion. Uh, let's see. Do I have feedback here? OK. Our panel tonight is a discussion of Modern Age, which is uh, a flagship publication of ISI and which, in fact, uh, dates back to 1957. It was founded by Russell Kirk. So Russell Kirk publishes The Conservative Mind in 1953. And this is sort of the seed time of the conservative republic of letters. 1953 is also, of course, the year in which ISI is founded. And uh, it's the year in which Robert Nisbet publishes The Quest for Community. Uh, Leo Strauss publishes Natural Right and History. It's a pivotal year. Four years later, Russell Kirk founds Modern Age. And it's slightly after uh, National Review. National Review is founded in 1955. But National Review, like human events before it, has a focus on uh, sort of the, the news of the past two weeks. Whereas Modern Age, uh, although Russell Kirk certainly intended for it, for, for it to be a, a publication with a broad readership, was something that would be able to focus on ideas and the debate among conservatives, even at the time, even in the 1950s, uh, between libertarians and traditionalists, between uh, you know, different outlooks on foreign policy. It's easy to forget right now that um, you know, there was a time when even the conservative approach to the Cold War was not something to be taken for granted. And both Russell Kirk and Henry Regnery, who was a co-founder of Modern Age, had uh, somewhat more critical or more uh, distant views about the Cold War than, for example, National Review, which was much more uh, hawkish at the time. It's not that you know, Modern Age or Russell Kirk or Henry Regnery was ever soft on the Soviet Union or soft on communism, but they were always concerned about the idea that America would uh, create a, a state that was kind of a mirror image of the Soviet Union in our own country in the course of fighting this totalitarian enemy. And they didn't want to see that America develop a kind of American empire as an alternative to Soviet communism. What they wanted to see was that we would be able to resist Soviet communism without, at the same time, becoming an empire ourselves. And of course, since the end of the Cold War, these questions have recurred with all the more salience. So Modern Age has been around uh, you know, for many decades now. Uh, I'm the current editor, Daniel McCarthy, and uh, I've had a fantastic team of colleagues who have helped me to put out uh, this journal every three months. Uh, that includes, above all, uh, Sam Goldman here, who is our literary editor. It's also included uh, Anthony Sacramoni, who is our executive editor, a uh, managing editor, I should say. And so, too, uh, we have a poetry editor, James Matthew Wilson. We have a recently added uh, film critic and drama critic, uh, Noah Millman, who has done absolutely uh, phenomenal work recently. And, in fact, I very much encourage you to pick up the most recent issue of Modern Age, because there's a brilliant essay in here by Noah, uh, not actually on film or stage, but on Kazuo Ishiguro and uh, his uh, novel's dystopian qualities, uh, the idea that all of his novels are about servants who sacrifice themselves to uh, an ideal that perhaps uh, is not deserving of their loyalty. So uh, Modern Age is a, you know, a, a periodical that combines the political and the, philosoph and the philosophical 
with the cultural and the literary, and it tries to provide a certain depth that perhaps uh, you know, more news-focused publications uh, do not have. So I wanted to begin perhaps uh, tonight's conversation uh, between myself and uh, Sam Goldman by uh, talking with Sam about uh, how he first became involved in Modern Age. He was uh, recruited as literary editor by my predecessor, who was Peter Augustine Lawler. And Sam has done phenomenal work uh, as our literary editor and has also brought an interest in television and other forms of modern media uh, to Modern Age. So Sam, tell us a little bit about uh, Peter Lawler, how you became involved in Modern Age, and uh, what vision you have pursued as literary editor. Well, so you, your, your description um, of how I became involved with Modern Age is actually very generous and slightly sanitized. So the truth is um, both, both Peter Lawler uh, and I applied uh, for uh, the position as editor, which had become uh, vacant, and we both interviewed and submitted our various materials, and wisely um, Lawler was, uh, was selected over me. But he was, he was very nice about it and invited me to work as literary editor, and he said, you know, Sam, um, the, some of you may have uh, met uh, Peter Lawler, although probably at this point you're, you're too young. He had an inimitable southern manner. He said, you know, it really should have been you, but I need this for my retirement. Um, so that was, that was how I was uh, recruited um, to Modern Age. And Lawler um, and I were both interested in expanding the range of conservative journalism beyond uh, responses to recent news and in some ways beyond politics in general. I, I think that one of um, the themes of our discussions over the last several days um, has been that a substantial conservatism that can meet the challenges of the time can't only be about elections and public policy. Um, it must also be about uh, religion, um, about the arts, and other activities that speak to the soul. So one of the things that I've tried to do uh, as literary editor is to um, attract and refine contributions um, that address some of these issues that are not obviously political, um, and to do so from perspectives that are not obviously conservative, but that nevertheless get at questions of uh, human nature, um, of our, our purpose, of the uh, structure of human communities in ways that are consistent um, with uh, the mission of, of the journal. And I think that the Noah Millman piece that Dan mentions uh, is a superb example of that. Um, Ishiguro, I think, is not a political conservative. I really have no idea what his politics are. And I also have no idea what Millman's politics are <laughs> exactly. Um, but, I, but I'm certain that the theme he explores in this piece, um, the subjection in, in these novels of, of a certain class um, of human and, since they're science fiction, non-human persons to the service of others deals with themes um, that are essential to conservatism. And it's, for that reason, um, a model of the kind of material that I've been proud to publish, um, but that I also uh, think should be published more, more widely um, and play a larger role in our conversations. That's right. I mean, Ishiguro is an, a novelist who is writing about themes of class, uh, in particular relations between uh, servants and masters. Um, he is most famous, perhaps, for The Remains of the Day, which was made into a Merchant Ivory film around 1990 and won a great many awards. I think it was an Academy Award winner. I think that's right. And um, since then, he has branched out into a number of science fiction novels including novels about um, clones who are created for the specific purpose of organ harvesting so that their organs can help the original human beings live longer. And um, so there's this ongoing theme which, you know, in a, uh, from a, a crude author, would be a kind of parable of Marxism, right, about the exploited working class and the master class that is taking advantage of them and is even, you know, destroying their very bodies and their very lives. 
But Ishiguro is, uh, as, as Noah Millman uh, explores in this essay for Modern Age, Ishiguro is most interested in the questions of soul, not just the questions of what is becoming of bodies. And he's interested in the ways in which uh, servants uh, really are defining themselves in terms of their relationships with the higher power that they're serving. And this, of course, has religious overtones as well as having uh, class overtones of politics and economics. So these are the kinds of things we like to bring out in modern age that have, uh, they have a political dimension perhaps, but they are not crudely, uh, you know, simply saying here is a conservative approach to a particular cultural issue. It's rather saying here's a cultural uh, perspective that is very important, that is seriously presented, and here is a perspective on it that allows conservatives to more deeply inform themselves about what's happening in modern culture, what's happening among you know, some of our most brilliant authors in terms of their investigations into the human soul as well as into the human polity and the state. Now, Sam has been very uh, helpful in the course of uh, my editorship over the past four years. Uh, Sam himself has a cultural background that you would not expect from seeing him up here on stage, uh, you know, as a uh, you know, nice, respectable professor. But Sam, you actually have a background in punk rock, which uh, perhaps the audience would be uh, surprised to learn about. That's not, not, a, not a subject we've covered yet uh, in modern age, although if we do, I, I can think of a few people who might be willing to, um, to write about it. Um, but it, th this, is, this is true and can be verified um, on the internet. So I, I came to the conservative world um, from the, the punk rock scene um, <laughs> because I, I made, when I was 19 or 20 years old, um, a, a terrible discovery, which is that punk rock is passe. It was not provocative. It was not challenging. It was really rather adorable. But if you really want to upset your family at Thanksgiving, or at least if you wanted to upset my family uh, at Thanksgiving, um, the thing to do uh, is to wear a, a bow tie and talk about Reagan. Um, so the, 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 you know, the, the, the pull of trolling uh, alone was, was sufficient. I, I, I like to think um, that I have grown in political and intellectual maturity since then, um, but not everyone would agree with that assessment. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's worth discussing, too, because it's, it's a way in which um, people's courses, the paths that lead them um, uh, through their careers um, and, more importantly, to the principles that guide their lives um, are, are rarely straight or predictable. Um, and being able to appreciate and accommodate that range of experience and disposition is one of the things that I, I think um, uh, the conservative tradition at its best is about. Well, I agree with that, and it seems to me that uh, Russell Kirk himself, while not having a background in punk rock, um, would very much agree with that sensibility. Um, Kirk, you know, was in many respects a, a Luddite. Uh, he banned television from his uh, home, and uh, when he found his daughters had sneaked a television into the attic and were watching uh, occasional programming, he ripped the television out of the socket, he threw it off of the uh, attic roof, crashed down to the floor, um, that was Russell Kirk's attitude towards technology even then. Uh, you can imagine what he would think about uh, the internet and about uh, the devices to which we ha constantly have our eyes fixed uh, nowadays. Kirk also famously described the automobile as the mechanical Jacobin. Uh, he was not a fan of uh, America's auto culture. And yet, um, it, it would be a mistake, a grave mistake, to think of Russell Kirk as a fuddy-duddy. On the contrary, Russell Kirk was someone who was very interested in science fiction, very interested in fantasy, and in fact, uh, you know, he's famous among conservatives for having written The Conservative Mind in 1953, but he's actually more famous among many other Americans for having been an author of um, both supernatural fiction and fiction that is kind of uh, up to the edge of the supernatural without quite crossing that line. So he wrote a novel called The Old House of Fear, for example, which was uh, his best-selling title of all, even uh, bigger than The Conservative Mind. It was, uh, I think, excerpted perhaps by a Reader's Digest. It was certainly very widely reviewed. And um, so Russell Kirk was someone who understood that the imagination plays an essential role 
in conservatism and in our civilization as a whole. Uh, this comes through in the conservative mind itself. It comes through, in fact, if you uh, are familiar with Edmund Burke, you know that uh, one of Burke's uh, earliest works was his essay on the sublime and the beautiful. Um, this idea of aesthetic experience and uh, the way in which our senses and our passions uh, influence our political outlooks and influence uh, the shape of our minds, these are themes that conservatives have explored um, in great detail over the course of the past 200 plus years. It may interest you to know as well that uh, Roger Scruton, uh, one of the other authors you have read for this conference, uh, he too had a background in aesthetics uh, before he became uh, you know, a philosopher known for his political views. And while punk rock may seem to be uh, far removed from uh, you know, the more elevated uh, you know, uh, quotations from Milton perhaps that um, uh, someone like Russell Kirk was referring to in, uh, you know, in various books and that Edmund Burke had been interested in, uh, in point of fact, um, all of these things uh, need to be understood by well-informed conservatives and by people who are citizens of their civilization and not just of the current moment, but of you know, this uh, tradition that goes back many centuries. I think- I would also just add briefly um, that Kirk, although he certainly had his own views on, on these matters, was not at all uh, doctrinaire. And one of uh, the circumstances that led him to establish modern age uh, was an unfavorable review of Leo Strauss's natural right and history in partisan review, um, which was at that time a leading journal of the intellectual left. Um, Kirk had many disagreements uh, with Strauss, although I understand that they got along well personally, um, but part of the inspiration uh, for modern age was to defend the reputation of a thinker who was in certain ways a critic and even opponent uh, from what Kirk regarded um, as an unjust attack. That's right. If you uh, happen to be familiar with Natural Right and History, which is the book that Leo Strauss published in the same year, 1953, that Kirk had published The Conservative Mind, you'll know that Natural Right and History actually presents a somewhat ambivalent or even critical view of Edmund Burke, that uh, Leo Strauss was afraid that Burke had contributed to the creation of a kind of historicism, a relativizing mentality that took history as uh, a matter in itself apart from uh, questions of fundamental natural right or natural justice. And Kirk obviously has a very different view of Edmund Burke. Kirk is, uh, you know, Edmund Burke's great champion and defender, vindicator, in uh, 1953. But as Sam has mentioned, uh, Kirk looked at the unfair way in which a publication like Partisan Review had dealt with uh, his uh, friend and friendly rival, Leo Strauss, and uh, considered that to be, uh, you know, such a provocation that there was a need for a conservative journal, a conservative answer to Partisan Review that could present a fairer and uh, you know, a kind of a, a more appreciative, uh, a more you know, sort of deeply thought through uh, consideration even of a thinker like Leo Strauss who was quite different in his outlook from, uh, from Russell Kirk. Partisan Review, by the way, um, Sam had alluded to it just a moment ago, but it, it really was the defining journal of what was called at the time and tends to be called even now, the New York Intellectuals, which were a set of thinkers um, many of whom had you know, an early flirtation with socialism or with uh, even varieties of communism, especially of the Trotskyist sort, but who you know, moved over time away from uh, the sort of hardline left and became a very interesting sort of mixed cultural journal. Someone like uh, Dwight MacDonald, for example, was a contributor to Partisan Review for many years. Uh, Dwight MacDonald was an interesting figure who um, actually came to have a number of conservative admirers. The historian John Lucas, for example, who uh, has published a number of books with ISI and who died just a few years ago. Uh, Lucas was an admirer of, of Dwight MacDonald. So there's this sense in which, you know, one of the things that modern age was doing was creating this dialogue and this discourse with counterparts on the American left, especially those counterparts that were not simply dogmatic, were not simply, you know, proponents, pro pro proponents of either communism or of socialism, but rather that did take high culture seriously. And there was a time, surprisingly enough, when the American left really did have a, an appreciation for, you know, um, belles lettres and for, uh, you know, high culture, which unfortunately uh, in the past, uh, you know, uh, decade or so, maybe even less, has been completely eclipsed by a cultural left which wants to uh, trivialize and reduce all of culture 
to questions of identity, questions of race and sex and so forth. Uh, Sam, you are uh, an academic yourself. Um, do you think that the, the plight of the academy is quite as bad as conservatives see it as being? Or is it, is it perhaps somewhat different, uh, but still quite troubling? It's, it's, it's very bad, but as you, as you suggest, it, it's not bad in quite the way conservatives often think. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in my remarks tomorrow morning. Um, the, 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 the worst elements of the academy are not actually found among the faculty or in the classroom. Um, but in the residence life administration that in many ways, as, as probably many of you know, is far more influential because you spend a few hours a day uh, in class with your professors. Uh, you spend uh, nine months a year under the domain um, of the student affairs bureaucracy. And whereas although um, political motives usually of a leftist kind do lead some people to pursue faculty careers, most members of the faculty are animated at least in part by a genuine love of their disciplines and the materials that they study and teach. This is not true for people who become deans of student affairs or resident advisors. Um, on the contrary, they tend to be people who really liked college but for whatever uh, reason didn't feel called to uh, a scholarly career and want to hang around as a kind of political uh, camp counselor. So, you know, you, you, you sometimes, you sometimes um, hear these, these uh, polemics against um, tenured radicals and faculty indoctrinating students. Um, and I think those arguments um, are often exaggerated. On, on the contrary, um, classrooms tend to be something of, of an escape from the much more stifling world um, of student, student affairs. Uh, but again, um, there's much more to the university. And if you track spending at your own institution, what you are almost certain to find is that they spend far less on faculty, particularly tenure track faculty today than they did 10 years ago, and far more on, um, on administration. So that's, that's not exactly a more favorable diagnosis um, than you've probably heard elsewhere, but it is um, a somewhat different one. And I, I think that Conservatives of one kind or another probably have more allies on the regular faculty than they tend to believe, but to face a much more forbidding uh, administrative landscape. This uh, infection or metastasis of uh, administrative power within the academy is something that has also spread to the private sector. Um, to, to you know, not just the nonprofit world, but also to the for-profit corporate America. And you see this in the form of HR departments. You see this in the form of basically internalized politburos, which have enormous authority over even the CEOs of companies, even the people who are at the highest uh, ranks of achievement. And they can now be held hostage by claims that they are... Um, insufficiently attentive to diversity, insufficiently attentive perhaps to pronouns or to other sorts of extravagant uh, sort of left-wing ideological innovations. And uh, we see the consequences that someone like um, uh, uh, Mr. Shatner, for example, from uh, uh, Papa John's Pizza, um, you know, can be set up and, you know, thrown out of the company that he had founded uh, because, you know, he... Uh, you know, was using the wrong language in an exercise that was meant to be a crisis response exercise. His publicity department said, okay, how would you respond to a claim that you were racist? You know, he started talking about Colonel Sanders. He started talking, you know, using various terms. And it, people who laugh are, are quite right. I mean, it was basically a kind of funny thing. And yet, once you take these things out of context and use them, you know, uh, in a way that is intended to uh, simply demonize uh, somebody, you're able to then create a cancel culture and that exists within corporate America, it exists within the university, and of course it exists uh, above all on social media. 
And it's something that, um, you know, we luckily have not uh, had Modern Age canceled. Uh, in We're part not because, hard enough. <laughs> well, I think in part it's because uh, we are operating at a high level where it's, you know, it, for one thing, it's, it's difficult to cancel people when you don't understand their ideas, or at least you, you can't even, you know, speak their language and, you know, see just how controversial they may be. The other thing, too, is that um, one of the things about cancel culture is that it is a form of cowardice. Cancel culture goes after the weak, the vulnerable, and the conflicted and the uh, ambivalent. Cancel culture does not like to go after the people who are strong, outspoken, and defiant. And in the case of conservatives, conservatives like you know, myself and, and I think Sam as well, we are very clear on where we're coming from. People who meet us, people who talk to us, know that we are conservatives, know that we are very firm in our convictions. And so we are seen as being sort of strange, exotic creatures as far as much of the left is concerned. But they don't, they don't have this sense that we can be easily mugged and easily, you know, sort of um, shivved and uh, disposed of in a, uh, a gutter, you know, in the, the midst of town. Rather, what they, they prefer to go after are uh, the people who are heretics within the church of liberalism, people who are, um, you know, who go out of their way to try to meet the demands of the radical left. And when they fail to meet those demands, they then are the ones who are, um, you know, canceled and dealt with in a, the roughest of, of manners. This has a certain parallel to experiences that conservative faculty had in the 1960s as well. So Robert Nisbet, for example, who many of you, uh, well, all of you should have read as part of our reading packet for this conference. And if you didn't, we are very disappointed in you. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful essay in there, by the way, about Rousseau. Um, Robert Nisbet was you know, a conservative on a University of California campus at the very height of the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War protests, you know, all of the most uh, extreme left-wing activism that was taking place on campuses in the 1960s and 70s. And yet Robert Nisbet was not uh, you know, sort of attacked. His offices were not occupied by radicals um, you know, because he was seen as simply being an outsider, as being a conservative, someone who was in a different category. Whereas a lot of faculty who were in the middle of the road, a lot of faculty who were traditional sort of center-left liberals, they were the ones that the radicals uh, went after. So I share that story because I think it's you know, something that many of you need to internalize, that to the extent that you are strong in your convictions as conservatives, it doesn't mean that you're dogmatic, it doesn't mean that you can't reflect on things, but it does mean that you understand where your own roots lie and where you are coming from. And that can be that sense of confidence that derives from that intellectual uh, tradition and familiarity with your own tradition. That will not only uh, see you, uh, you know, becoming a much, uh, you know, sort of more capable conservative in as you go on to, uh, you know, uh, whether it's further scholarship or whether it's into the world of business or into the world of politics. Not only is this co the, are these convictions empowering to you as individuals, but they actually act as almost a, uh, you know, sort of a, a clove of garlic or a crucifix when the vampires of cancellation come after you. <laughs> Because they see that you are strong and that you actually have, uh, you know, this familiarity with these roots of the conservative tradition. And uh, they realize, okay, this is not going to be an easy person to mug. This is not going to be an easy person to victimize. This is someone who, uh, on the contrary, is going to be able to uh, kind of meet the radical left at the, at the root level, right? Right at the, the, I mean, radical means going to the root of things. And conservatives who are capable to speak to the roots of their tradition, their civilization, their religious beliefs, their philosophical beliefs, they are capable of taking on the radical left in a way that people who are more complacent, both about their conservatism or perhaps about you know, coming from a, a center-left uh, liberal position, they are much more vulnerable and they are the ones whose weakness uh, is preyed upon by the radical left. One of the functions of a journal like Modern Age is precisely to provide conservatives and also to some extent non-conservatives as well, some you know, sort of classical liberals and others, with the kind of strength of their own convictions and the strength of their own roots that will allow them to defy the attacks of cancel culture and to do, uh, defy the attacks of uh, a radical left. Yeah, I think it's, it's a useful um, piece of career advice, which I know is a 
topic that many of you are thinking about and may ask about um, when we begin the questions, that there's very little advantage um, in concealing your views or pretending to believe things that you don't. Um, because first of all, the truth will will out, um, and at some point, um, whether a convenient or inconvenient time, um, it will become clear uh, in what ways you dissent from the prevailing orthodoxy. Um, but also because you don't you don't really want a, a job where they don't want you. So just as uh, as Dan says, and I, I think. Um, Nisbet is a good example. Um, in many ways, it's easier to be open about who you are and what you think than it is to conceal those things, um, because it's 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 weakness um, that attracts the attention um, of bullies, not disagreement or difference per se. That's right. And, you know, the disagreement uh, and difference per se are things that certainly will irritate the left and they'll come after you on the basis of them. But they will be um, a little bit uh, leery of doing so precisely because they know, OK, this guy is someone or this, this you know, man or woman is someone who knows their tradition so well that they're going to be able to fight back. And that's what the bullies don't want. They don't want people who are going to be able to fight back. They want to take advantage of uh, timidity. They want to take advantage of uh, natures that want to be uh, extremely charitable towards uh, where the radicals are coming from. Whereas we, you know, we take seriously uh, the many concerns that uh, might be brought up uh, from any direction of the political spectrum. But we focus on the fact that conservatives have honorable and indeed correct answers to all of the challenges, whether it's matters of race relations, whether it's matters of uh, anything from foreign policy to you know, representations of different cultures in, uh, in literature, in film, in music, and so forth. Uh, conservatism has nothing to apologize for, uh, no more at least than any other uh, point of view uh, that may be political or philosophical. Conservatism has uh, a very honorable tradition, which is extremely well represented, not only, I hope, by our own pages, by modern age, but certainly by Russell Kirk himself. And you can look at how Kirk addressed uh, various uh, conflicts within his own lifetime. And uh, he comes off very well. Um, you may know that the historian uh, and biographer Sam Tannenhaus who wrote a monumental biography of Whitaker Chambers about uh, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, is now working on an official biography of William F. Buckley Jr. And uh, Tannenhaus is something of a man of the left. Uh, he is someone who will be quite critical of Buckley in many respects. And uh, indeed, he's been you know, sort of uh, critical of many of our own uh, you know, uh, uh, figures connected with modern age, including Russell Kirk himself. And yet Tannenhaus, who is coming from the left, says that Russell Kirk uh, is almost the hero of his impending biography on William F. Buckley Jr., precisely because uh, Kirk was you know, sort of true to a conservative philosophy dating back to Edmund Burke and indeed beyond that. And this gave Kirk you know, a sense of humanity and a sense of um, an ability to recognize the dignity in individuals you know, of all backgrounds, including people who were coming from politically very different perspectives than Kirk himself. Uh, this humanity and this, this sense of, uh, of human dignity um, comes through not only in Russell Kirk's own works, but I think it also is something which um, has informed modern age over the course of the past six or seven decades. It's something that in, in a different respect, uh, even our current issue, the uh, summer 2021 number, um, attempts to give uh, representation to. So we have this uh, symposium on the future of the humane economy, uh, which includes uh, both a number of free market perspectives from Anne Bradley, for example, and from Richard Reinsch, and also perspectives which, while being supportive of free markets, think that free markets are not in themselves necessarily complete or going to provide for the support that American families need in order to be uh, secure in their future and in order to provide the foundations upon which everything else, including uh, enterprises, 
are built. And so you have uh, views from people like Oren Cass, for example, and uh, from my friend Rachel Bovard, who both talk about uh, the ways in which the tech companies, for example, are consolidating economic power and using that power in ways that are detrimental to our freedom. Uh, Oren Cass talks about ways in which measures other than simply uh, gross domestic product should be taken into account when we consider the health of a republic and the health of our families, the health of our country, rather than the tendency that you find among um, you know, certain kinds of economists to be very reductionist and to think of things only in terms of whatever can be measured uh, numerically. It's one of the key things about a journal like Modern Age. It is not simply um, aspiring to be scientific or social scientific in the crude way that so many academic journals do. Rather, Modern Age is a humane journal. It is a journal which wants to be rigorous in terms of its thinking, wants to be rigorous in terms of its presentation of fact and of history, but also is looking at fact and history and data through the lens of humanity and human experience and our place you know, under heaven and in our relationship to the metaphysical and the transcendent. Uh, this was something that Russell Kirk and that Edmund Burke, as your readings have shown you, have been dedicated to all along, and it's something that modern age has tried to reflect. Another thing we've tried to do that I think is evident in this issue um, is to provide a space for conservative scholars to reflect on history, including the history of conservative figures and ideas, um, which is quite rare, actually. It is, is consistent um, with the topic um, of this week. You were saying to me at lunch the other day that if, if conservatives don't write some of this history, somebody else will. Um, and the way they do it is very likely to be unfavorable. Um, so Tannenhaus's biography of, of Buckley, which is long awaited but will doubtless appear uh, one day, is an example. Um, but in this, in this issue alone, we have pieces um, by uh, academic historians or people with historical training on um, John Calhoun, um, on Thomas Paine, and other topics that I don't think um, would receive comparable attention um, in just about any other journal. I think that's right. Um, you know, one of the functions that a journal like this uh, can fulfill is, and again, this kind of goes back in some respects to uh, the dialogue with a, a publication like Partisan Review. Modern Age is also something that allows conservatives to have a dialogue with the academy where they have you know, a foothold. We have wonderful professors such as those we've heard from this week. But in general, university presses and universities themselves uh, do not have very strong representations of conservative authors or of conservative points of view. And there may be a tendency then to have a separation where you know, conservatives are not as engaged with academic literature and with uh, you know, the ideas coming out of the universities as they perhaps need to be, both for defensive purposes, but also because oftentimes the truth is to be found in scholars who you know, are not identifying themselves politically one way or the other, but who are simply doing very good work that needs to be um, understood and incorporated by conservatives. It's one of the things that modern age has tried to do. So we not, we not only cover the you know, sort of uh, political books that you might expect us to talk about, but also serious works of history, whether they're about Calhoun or uh, someone like Tom Paine, who's of course no conservative whatsoever, or for that matter, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan. We have a, a very nice review here by uh, Marcus Witcher about um, a couple of different books on Reagan that have come out in the past few years, which try to address either ably or ineptly uh, the uh, dimensions of the Reagan phenomenon that touch upon some of these current left-wing concerns about uh, sort of the racialization of politics. And uh, there's a certain hackneyed point of view that you find uh, many left-wing academics adopting, which says, well, Reagan was only elected in 1980 because of you know, racial appeals, because of the Southern strategy, because of you know, any number of uh, storylines of narratives that have been put out there and refined by left-wing academics. But then you have other left-wing academics who, in fact, um, are more open to alternative narratives and who do try to be uh, somewhat more balanced or fair. Even if they're still coming from the left, they nonetheless uh, take seriously the evidence that counteracts some of their own biases. 
And I think the, the advantage of uh, a review such as the one we have by Marcus Witcher in this issue, taking on a couple of different books about Reagan, is precisely that you can have a conservative looking for what is best within the academic literature that is being produced, not simply writing it all off as being worthless because it may be coming from a leftist uh, perspective, but rather saying there actually are significant degrees of difference between the books that have uh, a really stereotyped, uh, you know, sort of writing off conservatism uh, root and branch, and others that are taking uh, a much more reflective approach and are willing to actually, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, question their own left-wing biases, that you do have some scholarship which is, um, attempts to be fair-minded. It doesn't necessarily always succeed, but the attempt itself is something that conservatives should take note of and should uh, provide a, an adequate degree of praise for when it does, in fact, happen. Well, should we take some questions now? I think, I think that would be a, a wonderful uh, idea. The next stage of the agenda. So we have uh, microphones. And the two of us have you know, quite ex uh, extensive experience, uh, obviously through modern age, but also with uh, other publications and, uh, and with the academy, as, as Sam has alluded to. So uh, any, I, any you know, questions you have that relate to uh, journalism and to um, publishing, as well as uh, the world of ideas and scholarship, we're very happy to take. I feel like there's a lot of questions um, I can ask you, because I'm editor-in-chief of a publication on my campus. but. I suppose one uh, question I, de I have, I guess, which is relevant for everybody here in terms of career if they're interested, um, what are the most, I guess, straightforward or opportune paths, in your opinion, into getting into the world of journalism past college? Like, what are some good opportunities you would recommend we pursue if, like, that's somewhere where we would want to go? I think you have to know uh, what kind of journalist you want to be and uh, the extent to which different paths have been um, not just set by different institutions but have been politically um, pointed in one direction or another. So one of the important facets of the Collegiate Network is that we encourage reporting and we really want to see that you know, all of our student editors and writers uh, get some experience with reporting and that they are prepared to you know, go out there and actually find stories talk to sources and not simply promulgate uh, their own opinions, especially you know, if you're an undergraduate, uh, the number of people who will be interested in your opinion about a big uh, issue is going to be rather limited. Whereas if you're able to go out and uh, actually talk to sources and get new information about campus issues or about you know, issues in the wider world, that's valuable. And we've seen you know, a numerous uh, co Collegiate Network editors and writers uh, appear on things like Fox News, for example, appear on a number of uh, public, uh, you know, a number of um, programs, both locally and uh, nationally, when something significant happens on their campuses, or when uh, you know they happen to be in the right place at the right time, as a, uh, a big issue develops. So I would say that first of all, think about the extent to which uh, you want to be a reporter or an editorialist. Even if you want to be an editorialist, even if you want to write opinion, it's important to have a background that partially at least includes some reporting. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've done over the past few years is I've led uh, the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program at the Fund for American Studies. Now, Robert Novak is a very important figure because he uh, you know, was known for having a political column, known for having a column that included opinion, and yet every single column he wrote, he made sure always had at least one original fact in it. Uh, he would always conduct interviews. Uh, I also know, you know editorialists at the, uh, the Wall Street Journal, which I think is perhaps the, the finest editorial page in the country, perhaps barring the uh, New York Post, because uh, Saurabh Amari is running a superb uh, page there. But uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post are the, the, the creme de la creme. And um, I know at both papers, they put a high premium on their editorial writers also talking to sources, getting original information. They may be writing opinion, they may be writing perspective, but it has to have uh, some real meat to it. It has to have something that people are not getting elsewhere. So think about that, because if you want to be a, a straight ahead reporter, um, you're going to have to you know, confront the fact that uh, you know, most of the mainstream media outlets out there tend to have a political bias. And uh, it's very difficult to be a conservative who's going to talk about uh, you know, sort of pure news stories uh, in a way that's going to allow you to make clear that you're also a conservative. You're probably going to find that instead, uh, you know, you have to be just the facts. 
uh, in talking about your news story. Um, you may you know, deal with editors who, in assigning you to news stories, don't allow you to, conser to cover conservative perspectives on issues. Uh, there are certain biases here which um, just need to be taken account of, and it doesn't mean that you should not uh, you know, consider reporting as a very important line of work, just that you have to be prepared for some of the uh, you know, difficulties you will encounter. Just as if you go into the academy, you have to be prepared to be aware that there will be people who will look down upon you or will uh, be prejudiced against you simply because you are a conservative and they will be you know, sort of biased against your scholarship. Then on the other hand, if you want to be an editorialist, there too, you have to consider whether you are thinking of being an editorialist for a conservative publication, in which case the question is what kind of material do these different conservative publications need, or whether you're going to be an editorialist uh, you know, attempting to work at a mainstream institution, in which case, again, you have to take into account the biases of uh, those institutions. Now, I've always found that, um, you know, as Sam had said uh, with respect to the academy, you, you shouldn't try to pretend to be something that you're not. So if you really are someone who is passionate about uh, your conservatism coming through, whether as a reporter or as an editorialist, uh, then you have to be prepared to accept that and to look to uh, you know, publications that may have a conservative tilt as the places where you might want to work, or you know, um, uh, television networks or other things that may have a conservative tilt. Whereas, on the other hand, um, you know, if you are someone who um, just finds the act of reporting or just finds the act of editorial writing to be compelling and you don't always feel the need to include uh, a conservative angle on these things, then you may be someone who's very comfortable at a mainstream institution. You don't want to give up, of course, your core conservatism, but you, you are able to uh, kind of modulate that or, or create a bridge between your own personal conservatism and an institution which may have a tilt uh, in a different political direction. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So you, you kind of touched on it actually at the end here, um, but my question goes to the idea of we are right conservative, we care about that, but we're also young people that are trying to go into the professional world as we all know, there's challenges as a conservative going into the professional world. Um, so like a wise, wise person once told me, a fool for Christ is still a fool, right? Or, or like stupid for Christ is still stupid. Take that and put it in the conservative context, right? Stupid for conservatism is still stupid. Um, how can we wisely go about, right, our conservative lives so that we can still we don't get sidelined, right? We don't want to be canceled. We want to actually be useful for the movement. So how can we do that um, while still staying true to our core values, like you say? So much of Sam's talk tomorrow, I think, will touch upon these issues. And I don't want to uh, spoil what he's going to say uh, on Friday. However, um, I think that the first thing I would just say is that you don't want to, you don't want to just own the libs. You don't want to be a troll. Um, so being a serious I mean, you may want to, but well, that's it's not true. a good idea. In fact, you, you, you will want to, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but do think, you know, in terms of, uh, it's very easy when you're surrounded by leftists to simply want to poke them in the eye and, uh, you know, just meet them on their level in terms of vulgarity and crudeness. Um, but what I think a useful question to pose to yourself is, if you were addressing a, a, a more conservative audience, and you were not surrounded by progressives, you were surrounded by people who maybe disagreed with you on, on certain conservative issues, but who were fundamentally coming from a, uh, you know, a kind of similar background to yourself and that you could respect. How would you want to address that audience and how would you want to talk to those people? Um, and I think using that kind of tone and that kind of approach is, um, it's not only you know, commendable and virtuous in itself, but it's something that can actually win over to a surprising degree um, people who are turned off by the radicalism of the left these days, but who are intimidated by the radical left and therefore don't dare speak out. So I think it always surprises, um, you know, you, you, you're not gonna, you know, sort of uh, get the left to be so surprised by your civility that they're going to, you know, uh, start treating you correctly and, and, and uh, you know, being civil themselves. That's unlikely to happen. Um, but most people are not sort of maniacal, hardline leftists. And even on your campuses, a lot of people who do seem to be uh, extremely you know, intoxicated by uh, radical ideology 
may be a little more reachable than you expect. And for that reason, it is always worth you know, having a certain um, seriousness to the way you approach things. Or if you want to be humorous, be humorous in a way that is good natured and is not simply um, you know, sort of crudely taking advantage of the imbecilities that the left abundantly presents to us. Um, Sam, what are your thoughts on this? I think um, that particularly as you begin to explore um, professional possibilities, um, y y you should not hesitate to specialize. It's, it's, it's very unlikely that you are going to develop a comprehensive worldview to which you are going to convert a large number of, of other people. And even if you embark on that project, it takes a really long time. Um, but it's easier than you probably think really to become an expert on a particular issue and to convince people who don't share your views on every issue that you're right um, in, in that case. So Dan wrote a column, I think for The Spectator recently, about um, the, the anti-critical race theory uh, campaign of the last 12 uh, or, or 18 months. And one of the things that I think is striking um, about Christopher Rufo, who's led that campaign, is that he's a specialist. He only writes about one thing. And he writes about it in such a way that it's not necessary that you agree with him about everything. In fact, it's probably not clear what he thinks about everything. He only wants to convince you that he has the, the knowledge um, and the, the correct understanding of a particular issue. And I, I think that's, that's actually an attainable goal and can be a real comparative advantage. Um, rather than trying to be a generalist with correct opinions about everything, um, often it's a good strategy to become an expert on, on one thing. And that can make you very valuable, even to publications or other institutions that don't share your broader perspective, because it's not so easy to find people who know one field or topic well and can, can explain it in a way that's acceptable to non-experts. So I think you know, probably in a campus setting, that's less important. Um, but in a young professional setting, that can be very useful. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, there is still a level at which skill and excellence and expertise uh, generate a certain degree of respect and openness even unto themselves. Now, there are parts of the left which want to you know, say that you know, even mathematics, even the hard sciences are thoroughly corrupted by uh, you know, sort of uh, white supremacy or whatever, the, uh, you know, or, or cis-heteropatriarchy or something like that. Um, but most normal people, and even people who may be center left, still recognize that the world's best heart surgeon is valuable because he is the world's best heart surgeon not because you know, he happens to toe the correct line on some ideological obsession. And to a surprising degree, even if you're talking about economics, even if you're talking about perhaps a certain facet of the history of the conservative movement, uh, or if you're talking about a subject like nationalism, I mean, Sam has just written a book on that subject, um, even if you have uh, these topics, which are you know, perhaps not of the immediate sort of life or death impact of being the world's best heart surgeon, Nevertheless, uh, the expertise that you can develop in a you know, particular uh, direction, a particular field, can be something that generates respect for you among people who may disagree with your point of view overall. Um, that includes, I think, uh, you know, many aspects of the history of conservatism and the thinking of conservatism. Um, you'd be surprised because you know, someone like Russell Kirk, for example, is a figure that there are still some uh, you know, center-left types who are interested in learning more about. And if you are someone who has read all of Russell Kirk, you're able to talk about you know, who this great uh, you know, influential conservative thinker was, um, there will be a number of people, like Sam Tannenhaus, actually, whom we mentioned earlier, um, that will be interested in what you have to say and that will have a certain degree of respect for you. So, I mean, there is, there is still a little bit of a vestigial republic of letters in America where people who are serious about ideas and who have you know, taken the time and invested the energy in order to attain a really deep knowledge of a subject, um, they will still find people, even who may have political disagreements with them, who nonetheless uh, value the work that they do, value the conversation that they are able to have with one another, 
and uh, therefore have not only a degree of tolerance, but a degree of openness that uh, is essential if we're going to have a, a, you know, a political republic, let alone a republic of letters. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is actually just for Mr. Goldman. Um, sir, you touched upon it briefly, but I was just wondering what your favorite uh, punk rock band was. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's a good question. Um, the best band to emerge from punk rock is, is certainly The Clash. That's, that's an easy one. <laughs> but that's, that's not the same thing um, as, as saying uh, that, they're, that they're exactly my, my favorite. Um, so I listen to a lot of, a lot of The Clash, but sometimes uh, the simplest and, and first things are best in the, in the spirit of conservatism. Um, and I, I, I the, the, the older I get, the more I appreciate the glorious simplicity and stupidity of the Ramones, which, which, some, which, which somehow is still powerful and surprisingly subversive almost 50 years later um, when um, bands or, or other um, artistic uh, enterprises that were superficially much more provocative um, have become passe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dan.